1969, I woke up early, verified what I hoped would be true. Santa had come. After waking up the rest of my family, my sister Sylvia and I began distributing the gifts that were under the tree. We handed my dad a series of boxes that were wrapped and had no names on them, but we knew they went to dad and we knew exactly what was in them. You see, my dad worked for General Motors in Buffalo, which was more than 100 miles away from our home. So Monday night through Thursday night, he stayed in Buffalo and came home on the weekends. To fill up his evenings, Dad had gone to barbering school, and he became a licensed barber. So on Saturday mornings, the neighborhood kids and their dads would roll into our backyard, where Dad had a little shop, complete with an old-fashioned barbering stool, and he would cut hair, usually for free, because it was his way of nattering and keeping up with everything going on in the village. So at Christmas time every year, the neighbors would pool their money and buy Dad cartons of cigarettes. They were wrapped and given to Mom to put under the Christmas tree. But on this particular Christmas morning, Dad didn't open the boxes. He just stacked them next to his chair. After we had finished opening our gifts, Dad stood up and made an announcement that we certainly didn't see coming. Today was the last day he was going to smoke cigarettes. We watched him go to the hall closet, put on his winter coat and boots. He picked up those boxes and walked them across the street. And when Eddie came to the door, Dad handed him the boxes and said, Eddie, I've stopped smoking today. I thought you might enjoy these. Metanoia is a Greek word. And as a young Baptist kid, I understood metanoia to mean repentance. And of course, I associated it with this parable of the prodigal son, the son who goes off the deep end, hits bottom, has an epiphany, and suddenly turns 180 degrees to begin this contrite journey home to his father. But metanoia is not literally translated as repentance. It's translated as the verb to turn. And in scripture, it usually is interpreted as to turn toward God. And when we turn toward God, or toward anything, we necessarily turn away from something else. So metanoia is a process, a process of changing the landscape of our lives, one decision after another. But in real life, not the parable kind, metanoia is sometimes a slippery slope, two steps forward and one backward. True to his word, as far as I know, Dad never smoked another cigarette. But you know, it wasn't all that long before he took up sm smoking a pipe. <laughs> and he smoked pipes for a lot of years before he put that down, too. And then he took up snuff. And when I told my mom I was going to tell you the story, she said, Oh, don't tell them about the snuff. <laughs> but I have, and now she'll hear it on tape. <laughs> But when Dad was 70 years old, 30 years after that Christmas morning, he was, and he remained, tobacco-free for the rest of his life, another 20 years. There were a lot of metanoia moments along his journey. Sometime in 1969, he had that first moment, that realization that cigarettes just weren't going to be a part of his story anymore. On Christmas morning, when he told the family about that, he invited those closest to him into his circle of accountability. And when he walked them across the street and gave them away, he was having another metanoia moment, a decision point. Dad knew when he told Eddie that Eddie would tell everyone in the neighborhood that Bob Hazlett had stopped smoking. And now, the circle of accountability was the whole village. Every step that Dad was taking was intentional, and every step was moving him toward his ultimate objective. As I pondered today's parable, I wondered what God might want St. Martin's to hear in our season of Lent. The story of the prodigal son is so well known that the words prodigal son are part of our culture, but the story of the older brother is less well known. 
and it was his story that caught my attention. This is the brother who's doing everything right. Day after day, chore after chore, he is obedient to the father. He's been working alone in the fields, doing the work of two brothers, and he tells us rather indignantly that dad hasn't thrown even one celebration to acknowledge everything he's been doing. But in the parable, this older brother is meant to represent the Pharisees around Jesus, those people who are doing all the religiously right things, but have somehow lost sight of why. The older brother has it all figured out. He knows his role, his place in the family. He knows his father has disinherited the wayward son. And he knows that whatever family fortune remains, he will inherit it. In this older brother's paradigm, he knows that the father loves him because he has done everything asked of him. So when the father welcomes home the wayward son as if he were a celebrity, he turns the older son's paradigm upside down. How could this be fair? It's clear to us that the older son has done all these good deeds for the wrong reason, to earn his father's love. It isn't that the father, God, doesn't appreciate good deeds, but that all creation, the older son and the prodigal son, the bits of life we understand and the bits we don't, the people who look like us and the people who don't, the people who pray like us and the people who don't, all of us are living manifestations of God's love. It's important that this parable doesn't tell us what happens to the older brother, because he has arrived at a metanoia moment. Will he turn to his father? To do so would mean leaving behind his resentment and allowing the father's love to become something more than a merit badge. Will he linger in anger, unable to turn to his father? Some of you may recall that I introduced my dog, Dursi, to you last fall. Dursi is now 11 months old, and he is 60 pounds of unbridled energy. And he has a handful of toys, but there is one that is more cherished than any other, and it is this thing. <laughs> this green, hairy, furry blob. I have no idea why, but I have discovered there's a squeaker inside of it that I think might be manufactured by Tylenol. <laughs> Darcy puts this thing in his mouth and he chews on it like a child that has way too much gum in his mouth and just won't let it go. And I have found that there are just two things that will cause Darcy to let go of his toy. And the first is a command. Darcy, leave it. Given that command, he will hang his little head and drop that thing to the floor. But the second reason he'll let go of it is by his choice. He will drop that every time for food. Not dog food, my food. <laughs> Anything that I am serving on my table, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, he will make the choice to drop that every time. Oh, that our human decision model seems this simple. A, a long-time matriarch of our parish, Kathy Watson, used to say this, every choice you make changes your options. Every choice you make changes your options. And to that I would add, every choice you don't make changes your options. So as you enter this week of Lent, I invite you to ponder where God might be calling you to let go of something to leave something behind, to turn toward God. The good news of this parable is that God the Father loves us. No matter where we are on our journey of faith, God loves us. God loves all of creation. And in our Book of Common Prayer, we'll find the mission of the church, the big capital C church, is written for us to know. The mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. 
for St. Martin in the Fields to take up her role in that mission, we must discern as a parish what God is calling us to let go of so that we may turn toward God and more fully participate in the kingdom of God on earth. Letting go and taking up, that is not a one-time event or even a straight path. But each time we let go and take up, we turn our trajectory ever closer to God. And as Christians, that is our ultimate objective. Amen. Thank you.